So for those of you who aren't familiar with MinIO, I think we should probably start by saying this, and that is that MinIO does only one thing. We only do object storage. Um, we focus on that um, relentlessly. We focus on that obsessively. We want to be the best in the world at providing object storage. Um, we were built over the last five years, and as a result of that, we are Kubernetes native. You know, we are cloud native, um, and we use all of those principles, those engineering principles that were designed for those infrastructures, uh, and we apply them to exactly what it is that we do from an object storage perspective. We were always targeting large-scale data infrastructure. We were always targeting performance. And we were built from scratch, like I said, in the last five years, and that's allowed us to really have this leadership position in the private cloud, and that's what's positioned us so well to be successful in the public cloud. So that's what we're focused on, performance, cloud native, and simplicity. And those are actually our guiding principles. Um, when you think about what is cloud native, when you think about the fact that we were built in the last five years, you recognize the fact that when we were coming up and we were starting this company, we were already seeing uh, Kubernetes uh, as a winning platform. We were already seeing containerization. We were already seeing RESTful APIs. We weren't um, trying to port a legacy system, uh, a POSIX-based system over to, uh, to, to what it is that we do today. So we were born in the cloud. We have cloud native DNA. It's a part of what it is that we do. And that's really on evidence. When you go type in um, MinIO plus any one of your favorite um, cloud native applications, it's traffic, Grafana, Prometheus, you're gonna find a video, a how-to, a medium blog post uh, about MinIO and those. And so we are very uh, comfortable in that world. Um, and that's the one that we exist in. The other thing that we focused on um, right from the get-go is performance. We always saw object storage as being the primary storage platform, not as a secondary storage platform. And in order to achieve that, we had to be performant. And so we have focused relentlessly on thinking about, does this make us faster? Will this slow us down? And we've published the benchmarks that uh, are still the industry's fastest and they're over a year old. Um, but we're doing 181 gigabits a second on NVMe, uh, on reads, 171 on writes, and that's on a 32 node NVMe setup. We're doing 16 on uh, reads and 11 on writes for HDD for a 16 node setup there. And that makes us the world's fastest object store. And being fast isn't just, um, it's a vanity thing for us. Being fast allows us to expand the map when it comes to workloads use cases um, and, 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 and the like. So we can now run as primary storage, analytics workloads, AI and ML pipelines. We can do application workloads. All of those things come into play when you're fast. And that's one of the things that we focused on. And for that sole reason, it allows us to do more than just simple archival workloads, which object storage has become well known for due to its incredible scalability characteristics. I think the last piece from a guiding principle and understanding- hey, Jonathan? Know. Yeah. Um, so primary storage is a number of characteristics. Uh, obviously throughput is, is significant and, and to a certain number of application workloads, but uh, latency is the other question that needs to be answered here. And I'm not sure, you know, object storage is primary storage is somewhat hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want me to take that? Take yeah, please. Question? Yeah, so it, it, the question is very valid and uh, the answer to that question, if you, to understand, you have to see how the public cloud infrastructure is built. In the public cloud, the object storage idea is actually to rethink how storage was implemented in the past. And uh, historically, databases and some of these VMs and class of applications perform the mutations like small block 4K and 512 byte type operation mutations across the network. And it led to a lot of chatty workload and the primary storage applications were fundamentally VMs and databases, right? That's where the high IOPS requirement was a must have for, a, for the primary storage workload. But the public cloud vendors very early on understood that that's not going to scale. If you convert IOPS game into a throughput game, 
throughput is very easy to scale. And whether it's hard drives or NVMe, network has gone easily to 100 gigabit. That's a much cheaper problem, scalable problem. But then to convert, you have to break all the legacy compatibility. No longer NFS 06 based APIs, the traditional iSCSI, fiber channel over Ethernet, all of that is completely gone. And if you look at the public cloud, Primary storage is object storage, and it's just a blob store with a HTTP RESTful API. But then how come they don't have this problem, right? You look at Snowflake to uh, BigQuery, Power BI, anything you look at, they actually use S3 API, but how come they don't have the latency problem? Because they actually download the blob, they mutate in memory, and then commit it back when it's ready. All mutations are performed local and not across the network. So a modern primary storage is simply a blob stored with REST API. All right, thanks, A.B. Yeah, thank you, great question. Um, I think the last principle um, beyond performance is, is simplicity. Um, and again, this is an area that MinIO is particularly focused on. Um, simplicity is really hard to do well. Um, it requires an incredible amount of discipline. Um, it in, uh, requires an incredible amount of focus, but there's a huge payoff. Simplicity scales, right? And so if you build a system that is simple, you build building blocks that are simple, um, you reduce complexity, it scales more effectively. It scales more effectively from a machine perspective, it scales more effectively from a process perspective, and it scales more effectively from a human perspective. And so that's an area that we are um, really, really uh, concentrated on. It guides what, a lot of what we do, and we think it's really important to the overall story of BinIO. Those principles um, have been very good to us. Um, it has produced a, a remarkable journey from a growth perspective. Um, MinIO is, uh, I think, a, you know, it's on every single continent, including Antarctica. Um, it is a global phenomenon at this point um, in terms of where it is deployed. And we see continued growth on huge numbers, right? So when we were here last year, where I think we were at 305 million Docker pulls, we're at 470 million at this point, right? A 54% increase. And that includes um, the rate limiting uh, you know, thing that went into effect back in uh, August and uh, later in the year. But we're also accelerating, right? We see even a 59% growth in daily average Docker pulls. Um, and so you can see that acceleration. We're accelerating into this growth curve. We're not starting to slow down at this point. And we're still talking about massive numbers, 470 million Docker pulls at this point. And we see the same sort of growth uh, across our community, right? We have a 33% increase in GitHub stars. We've got 25,000. That's three times what Seth is. That's 10 times what Swift was. Um, and so it gives you a, con a sense of what the, the scale of what it is that we're doing. And then we're also driving our Slack membership as well. And we're particularly proud of that. We've got more than 10,800, um, close to 11,000 at this point, members of our Slack community that are there helping each other, that are there, we're helping them, um, but growing. And that's also reflected in the number of contributors that we have. So it's an incredible healthy community. It's driving us forward. I think the other thing to point out um, at this point is that everywhere we are, right, these 18,000 organizations and individuals that run MinIO, everywhere that we are, our competitors are not. They may already have some enterprise, um, uh, that enterprise may already have some object storage for the archival piece, but the, we're winning every one of those modern workloads and we're never going to give up that lead. And I have a question yeah. about the, uh, the install base that you have. There, these are really impressive, incredible numbers, but how does that translate in terms of actual customers, in terms of you know, customers which are actually paying for the features, bringing in revenue and so on? Can you yeah. tell us so more about that? Yeah, we're, we're going to cover that in more detail when we get down to the subnet section. So subnet is the, is the engine for commercial licenses. It's how you consume um, a commercial subscription with MinIO. Um, you know, we're a private company. We don't get into telling you exactly how many customers we have. It's just not in our best interest. Um, it is, uh, we'll show you some growth rates on that, but it's dozens upon dozens upon dozens uh, of, of customers. How, how do you see your, uh, you know, what, what does a MinIO customer look like? Because I think there's a, there's a really interesting question about object as production storage. You know, kind of Ray hinted at, at some of the, the queries you may ask. And one of the things that would I would look at from a, a, an enterprise architect point of view is what do we, how do we address the kind of lack of native object support in, in many enterprise applications? 
So I, let me talk to the first point, and then I'm going to let AB talk uh, about the, the support for native object storage. Um, so first of all, I would tell you that, um, you know, our customer base uh, runs the gamut. You know, it is everyone from startups getting started to Fortune 500. 58% of the Fortune 500 runs MinIO in some capacity today, right? It's a huge number. Not all of them are customers, but 58% of them are running MinIO in some capacity today. That's up from 50% last year. And you can't just flip that over, right? This is areas where we're growing inside of those area, uh, those customers that we already had. And we added another 8% of that Fortune 500 just over the last year. So it's uh, it runs the whole gamut um, from all those organizations. And you know the ones that are on record and, and, and talking about that, Box is on record of talking about that, Seagate's on record of talking about that, PGRX, uh, public trade, publicly traded company um, is on record talking about MinIO. I mean, obviously there's dozens and dozens more, but those are the ones that are that are out there speaking about what it is that they're doing with MinIO today. So, um, you know, that's what the, the customer base looks like. They are cloud native. Um, they're looking to support cloud native workloads, uh, whether that's uh, Veeam or Kasten, or whether that's uh, Smart Store for Splunk, or whether it's NAS for Teradata. Um, you know, these are all areas in which they're, they're working. And then obviously there's the huge AI ML pipeline um, piece. We have a very big presence in finance. Um, there are at least, uh, well, 10 of the large, 10 largest banks in the United States run MinIO. Um, eight of the largest 10 uh, banks in Europe run MinIO. Um, we also have a huge presence in the autonomous uh, vehicle market, given the fact that our, M, uh, our binary is only 50 MB and can fit almost anywhere. Um, we have very, very strong, um, uh, deep roots in the defense and aviation community and space community. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a very wide spectrum of that. AB, do you want to take that, the question on native object storage support? Yeah. So the, the, the to continue on what Jonathan was talking about, right, the pull came from the applications team and the data team, not so much from the storage team itself, right? Every organization we look across, they basically, there were three silos. There was enterprise IT managing file and block and VMs, the traditional way. Then there was a cloud native DevOps team managing cloud infrastructure as part of their modern containerized applications. And then the third one was the data engineering team that built data lakes, like the typically Hadoop all the way to Teradata and Vertica. The pool that we got was actually from the applications team and the data team, because the applications themselves, be it a, a Splunk type workload or Druid or anything, you know, TensorFlow, uh, even all the way to Kubernetes Kubeflow, they actually used MinIO very early on in their development phase, and they used S3 API as their primary storage API. And once the once these vendors and these projects announced S3 API support natively, you would find in most of these projects in the documentation, it would refer to MinIO. They would show demo based on MinIO, right? And similar, like similarly in the application space, application developers actually used MinIO all the way since the development time and all when it goes to production. When that happened, then IT started noticing that applications team and data teams asking for petabytes of storage space because end of the day, IT was the one managing physical infrastructure and they did all the procurement and they learned that applications team already brought in object storage, very much like they brought Kafka, Cassandra, or Elastic or anything else into their stack. MinIO was already there. But then IT realized that they have to take control and centralize the object storage and bring a cloud native infrastructure into their organization in a way that it is compatible with the public cloud. So that's how the transition is happening right now. Do you have any I so any idea on so when you're you're deployed in these organizations, how much uh, is deployed in a test dev environment and how much is deployed in production? So the, the, the lines have blurred already in terms of what is test and dev and production, because in the cloud native environment, you actually don't roll out once in three months or once in a year, you roll out even multiple times a day. So we see that the, the development starts in, in a way that like, these application developers, they don't have three months, six months for the infrastructure to be built, provisioned, taken to production. They have to take it to from zero lines of code in just few months. It's already running on the cloud and they are in, they are modernizing it, improving it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then that happens, 
Minaiu basically is already there in that stack. And then what we see is they're pulling every day. But then we see an increase in the pattern. We, the, we, the, when do we know that it is production? We, uh, it, it, the, the usage increases slowly over a period of time. And then, uh, and then it also widens. You see more, uh, more and more nodes growing. We cannot collect private information that is a violation of privacy rights, right? But, but then they come back to our Slack channel, to our conferences, to everywhere. And then we know when we hear back from them, when it hits a production environment, when it becomes critical part of their infrastructure, they just sign up as a customer. 